Nobody has a hidden chair next to me. All right, so time for the second talk. Uh, it's Phil from the UK. Uh, do we have to pronounce your last name on French or? Legata. 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 Um, and nobody has really run away, so I'm really happy you're staying. Uh, okay, and we even got some new people in. That's good. Okay, Phil, cool. it's all yours. Okay. So I think my talk's going to be quite complementary to Jan's, um, and also there's another talk later on JavaScript for Enterprise. So, um, so there might be a little bit of crossover, but I think some of it might actually solidify some of the stuff that, that Jan was saying even further. So yeah, um, talking about building front-end apps that scale, uh, complex apps. Just turn on. Okay, yeah, so my name's Phil Legator. I work for a company called Kaplan Systems. Um, the reason I'm at FOSDEM is that we're open sourcing something called Blade Runner JS. To understand why we're doing that, I guess it's worthwhile speaking about Kaplan Systems. So we have a whole bunch of components that we license to large financial institutions and sometimes other companies. Um, and they tend to be kind of real-time components, things that you plug into trading systems, trading backends. Um, and also we have kind of real-time data distribution technology, for instance, a Comet WebSocket, basically a real-time server. On top of that, we have a bunch of technologies, client libraries that connect to that server. And because we're talking, targeting the financial market, people build trading apps on there. Um, and the main trading app that people tend to build is um, a web browser-based one, so HTML, JavaScript, HTML5. So we've been doing this since around 2000. I joined them in 2001. I've left them and come back again and then left them and then come back again. So they're a really good company to work for, although I occasionally get fed up. But that's just been in technology. You like to change up a bit. But I've joined them to open source this Blade Runner JS product. Um, so as we were building these, these complex front ends for customers, and customers were taking this technology and building stuff, we hit a bunch of pain points that, that when we were trying to build these very large scale applications with complex functionality, we wanted to kind of work around those things and improve the developer workflow and improve the, the way that the code is structured and the way that um, components within that UI and uh, communicate and the way that we communicate with backend components. So that's what Blade Runner JS is. It's a, a toolkit, a developer toolkit, a bunch of micro libraries on the front end to build these these complex <coughs> front end applications. So I'm going to cover what is a large scale JavaScript app, a complex app, some of the signs of scaling. These are kind of based on personal experiences from around 2010. So I've actually rejoined them for the past six months to pick up this tooling to work out what they've done to solve the problems. Um, so this is the, the signs of kind of from personal experiences from around 2010. And then what the solutions are with demos. I was going to code, but then I decided last night to record the coding. So <coughs> that's videos and I'll just talk through them. So sorry for bottling out. So what's a large scale app? So who's heard of Adi Osmani? Just a few people. Okay, well, so Adi Osmani used to work for Yahoo. Might have been AOL then Yahoo. Anyway, so he then works for Google. And he defines these, these large-scale apps as, as requiring significant effort, developer effort to maintain. And that's obviously a key thing. Complex applications will require lots of effort to maintain. So you need to make sure that maintenance is relatively easy. Um, and loads of heavy lifting goes to the front end. The displays, uh, data manipulation display falls to the browser. So that kind of makes sense. But I want to provide a bit more information specifically. You're going to have a large code base. So complex functionality. Um, you know, your application does lots of stuff, there's going to be lots of code. doesn't matter what, how good a developer you are, you might be able to write loads of cryptic things, do, win the 1K JavaScript competition, but ultimately, if you've got lots of functionality, you're going to have lots of code. So, to look at Kaplan Trader, so we took measurements, um, I don't know, a few months ago when I did this, we actually had 104,000 JavaScript files, um, so around 131,000 lines of code. Um, you can work that out, 131 lines per file. So we try and keep each file being a single class. 650 test files and 95,000 uh, lines of test code. Excuse me, Phil. This is front end. Yeah, this is all front end. Yeah. Um, and then we also have thing, a thing called a motif. So customers have um, different, they, they will work potentially in different asset classes, so foreign exchange or fixed income or something. So we have um, getting started apps called motifs that we they can take along with Kaplan Trader. And that's the size of one of these motifs. So, so we, we build and maintain this SDK, and on top of that, we build and maintain these motifs, these getting started apps. 
that we deliver to customers and they're expected to take that away and use this tooling to, to hopefully not turn this application we've given them into spaghetti code. So we need to give them that tooling to maintain that as well. And on top of this, there's all the other assets. There's HTML, CSS, images, IETN files, config, and so on. So it's a pretty huge set of code base. So an application of that size is obviously going to have lots of complexity. So I want to provide a couple of examples to, to define what a complex app is. So who uses Gmail? Okay, almost everybody. Okay, so we all know Gmail is a complex from an app. It's probably your go-to reference point. If we look at the functionality, we can view our emails. We can search, we can do advanced search. We can filter the contents of this by clicking on one of these labels. We can um, open and close this label section. We can, we can kick off a hangout or a chat. We can use Google's uh, predefined category filtering. We can page through our emails. We can look at our settings. We can jump to other um, application <coughs> types like Drive. We can compose a rich email. We can search our contacts list with this too. We can even jump over here and go into our contacts or tasks. So you can see it's a, it's a really complex front end application. And it does all that without obviously the page refreshing. So Kaplan Trader, um, this is Kaplan Trader 3. I did a video last night, Kaplan Trader 2. I hope that comes up all right. So I'm going to stand over here so I can see what I'm doing. Right, so this, this is kind of the front end as it loads. We've got a bunch of these trade tiles. It's obviously got a UI that we can drag around and move, <coughs> move components around. I can execute trades. That wasn't in a real trade, hopefully. Um, <laughs> uh, we can switch between these different layouts. We've got here, we've got a component which is a chart. We can drag it around. I've got some real-time news here on the left, which is kind of suggestions, trade ideas. <coughs> There's also text studies up there. Um, hopefully I'll click on the next one. Yeah, so this, I don't know what that is. It just looks complicated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've got a whole bunch of grids. Um, we can drag and drop items from there into this um, watch list. What else we got? As you can tell, I'm not really into finance, but I like the front-end technology. Um, we can do filtering on these very large grid sets. So this actually goes to a back-end component, and we get this, uh, this filtered list. We've got these things called containers, where you can dr drill into a tree structure. And these are charts just waiting for information to be dropped over. So we can do that. I wrote this with a, the team back, back in about 2010, so this has been around for a while. So that's the other thing about these code bases, they'll be around for, for quite a long time. We've got a really nice heat map up here to show which trades are being active at the minute, and which stocks. We've got the ability to scroll, so this is only 100 um, rows, but we have tens of thousands of rows in some of these, some of these um, containers. They're obviously not all loaded in the front end at the time, but as we, as we change that window, um, we request more data. We can bring in new components and drag and drop them in. So in this case, it's Bloomberg TV. Uh, we've got settings and so on. So you get the idea it's a pretty complex front-end application. So they're both single-page apps. You kind of load them once at the start of the day um, and leave them open, more or less. You prob I probably leave Gmail open the whole time in one of my tabs. Um, it's got lots of complex functionality, and there's lots of complex interactions, whether that's the user interacting with this UI or whether it's the in application interactions, so interactions between components, um, or interactions with back end components, so front end calling back end. And there might be multiple back end components. I mean, there definitely are. If you look at things like Gmail, there'll be a contact service, an email service, a chat service, and so on. Probably an attachment service. So the next thing I want to talk about is the contributors. So when you have a large scale application with a large code base, you're not going to have one person. It's highly unlikely you're going to have one person. If you do have one person doing it, you should probably be told off. Um, so you can have multiple people managing and maintaining this code base. You can have front-end developers, obviously it's a front-end app, but you're also going to have back-end components that are being interacted with, so there's going to be back-end devs. You might have designers that are providing either assets or going in and editing CSS and HTML, maybe some JavaScript behaviours. You might have QA engineers that are editing some of the test code, that's certainly the way we work. Um, and we have infrastructure and release engineers might be contributing to maybe the config files in certain things. Um, or our release engineers actually on the Blade Runner JS team at the minute. We've got a guy that was, was a release engineer who is now working on the core dev team. So, and we've also got technical authors or potentially copywriters that might be changing maybe language files. So all of these different types of people might be contributing to this app. But not just that, it might be a very large team with all these different people in there. 
or it might be multiple teams in the same organisation, or spread across the organisation across, um, across the globe. Or even in our case, we have professional services teams which might be working with a company, the, with a, a financial organisation, together on the same code base to help them deliver that, uh, that trading app. So, lots of text. Um, how do you keep that, that maintainable? That's the question, really, isn't it? So you've got to structure that code base. So where are the jobs with files, the CSS, the HTML, and so on? You need an architecture to support all, that, all the code base, bringing, bringing these things in together, um, allowing for you to build that complex front-end um, architecture and the communication between these components, communication with backend components. You need to make sure all these con contributors can work in harmony, so they're not conflicting, they're not making changes and coming up with conflicts. We've got source control that lets us detect conflicts and do merges, but it, the, the best type of merge is when there isn't one and there isn't a conflict and we can just continue uh, working. And above all this, we need to make that developer experience productive so that we're focusing on writing code for functionality and not working around the, the development environment that we've got. And we need to get all these things to work together. So the next thing I want to talk about is just these few points of scaling, seven signs of scaling. It sounded quite good. Um, and some of them are probably obvious, but hopefully that just means you know it's true. So the development setup. So if you get a new starter, someone coming to join your company, and they go, right, you need to set up, you're going to be working on this Captain Trader app. You need to set up a whole bunch of infrastructure. So there might be a database, auth services, um, this real-time server in, in the case of um, our product whole bunch of web APIs for different things, maybe searching historical data or contacts, your dev application server, and maybe a bunch of other things. Um, or one of the problems we had as well is when we started a new product, we didn't really have a, a base to start from all the time. It was right, okay, we had to go through a whole bunch of pain to set up the infrastructure and the code base for our, for our new app. So we need to solve these problems. So once you've got kind of that basics in place, you might come across the problem is your app won't load. You go back to your dev, dev setup environment and go, ah, oh, we had a bunch of config that wasn't correct. We've got a bunch of services that weren't actually running as they were supposed to. So you're coming across all this, this pain because of all these back-end dependencies. And you've got lots of moving parts. So there's, a, there's opportunities in all this that there's something that isn't quite right. Because you've got a large-scale app. You've got loads of different components. It's complex. You get the app running, but it isn't working. So you manage to get all the infrastructure in place. Your app loads. <coughs> But functionality isn't working because someone's made a change, maybe to the left-hand side of the screen of the grid, and all of a sudden it's, it's broken the charting functionality. That shouldn't happen. These two things aren't related. So how do you stop that sort of stuff from happening? One of the things we've got as well is um, we've, we've talked about, um, Andrew mentioned concatenating files. So how do you make sure that you've got your dependencies lined up so the files are concatenated in the right order? Now, when it comes to... A thousand lines of Java, a thousand files of JavaScript, 131,000 lines. It's quite easy <coughs> sometimes if you've got the wrong system in place to end up with concatenation out of order. So you try and call a function or, or create your instance of a class before it's actually been defined in the code base, the code that's loaded, the concatenated file base. So that was a big problem we had. How do you find the files related to the piece of functionality that you're trying to edit in here? So. This I had to go into perforce on the web that we've got and dig out and try and find this. This is Captain Trader 2 as code base. So how do you know where your, your trade tile functionality is defined and where the CSS for this button is defined? And I want I really want a nice whacked kind of piece of JavaScript here. But the thing is that you've got all these different people contributing and loads of and we're human beings, we're creative, we do things in different ways. JavaScript's massively flexible. The problem is, if you let people do what they want, you'll get a, a code base that's just all over the place. Um, so you need consistency. You need people doing things in similar ways so that no matter who it is that's looking at a piece of code, they understand how that code's structured. Otherwise, you'll get a bunch of side effects and all sorts of stuff going on. The next one that I think is quite interesting and something maybe people haven't thought of is the amount of time it takes from changing a piece of code, you generally reload your app, and how much time during your day. You, live reloads are quite a big thing at the minute. You change code, it reloads your app. So if you look at Gmail, so if I've, I've just started my video there, I refresh 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 seconds. So if you work quite, quite iterative, iteratively and you make a change to a piece of code, you reload the app. Okay, is that working? Right. Make a change to the code, reload the app. You do that a bunch of times during the day. 
that's a 10 seconds every single time. So that really eats into your, your productivity. Um, and one of the problems I have with that is that I tend to get distracted by an email or, um, or tweet deck or you know, Twitter or something. So that, during that 10 seconds, there's an opportunity there for you to just lose focus. <laughs> tests, you're gonna have loads of tests. So you need to make sure that you can uh, run your tests in a granular way. You don't have to run all the tests. We had, a, we had a, um, a problem where we actually had to run all our tests for the whole um, application when we were changing, um, changing functionality. So it became a bit of a problem that we were spending ages waiting for tests to run. It's a bit like the new compilation thing, isn't it? I'm not waiting for my code to compile, I'm waiting for my tests to run. And as a really, really, really bad example, we had a, a full suite of tests that we pushed into continuous integration. We had a suite of um, VMs running and it took us eight hours to run our full set of tests on the Kaplan Trader 2. And we had to run those overnight. We had a smoke, smoke set of tests that we ran for about, maybe took about an hour or two hours for every commit. Um, so this eight hours just wasn't acceptable, especially when the results were flaky and we couldn't rely on them. Basically at the end of each week, we used to have to aggregate the results and go, does that mean the app's all right? So that just doesn't work. So what are the solutions to this? So we had to come up with a bunch of goals. We obviously want the uh, developer workflow to be as, as streamlined as possible to, as I said, focus on writing code, uh, focus on writing features. We want people to do things in consistent ways so we can define some rules for people to, to adhere to and ways of building stuff. We wanted to focus on building a single feature in isolation. I think, I think this is one of the core things. You don't really want to be building, um, why, say I'm, I'm, I'm on the Gmail team. Why do I need the chat, chat bit of my application running when I'm working on the composing an email bit? Why do I need um, the search functionality there when I'm working on paging a view of uh, emails? Um, yeah, so scalability. We want to be able to plug in these different components without having loads of side effects. We want to be able to extend and make this application have lots, of, lots more features without affecting all sorts of things. And we also need, need it to be um, of high quality. Now, maintainability, as Adi Osmani said, that's the thing, but you don't want to be spending that much time maintaining that you can't extend it. So it, it needs to be highly maintainable. So let's have a quick look at the dev workflow. So this is probably the same for most things. So what we, what we do is we, uh, now we have the, our tooling and we just create an app skeleton. We have a standard way of creating our apps. So we create our app skeleton. We're building a feature. So we go, right, okay, what is the feature I'm building? I'm gonna create a skeleton for that feature. It gives me the structure that I need for that single piece of single feature. I write my JavaScript, my HTML, my CSS. I start writing the functionality for that. I obviously write loads of tests and run the tests and they all pass. And then I can run it in isolation. I can take that single feature and run it on its own and start manipulating the UI and having to play with it to make sure it's working as I expect and using the amazing um, browser dev tools that we've got at the minute to really help me work through that dev, dev workflow. Is the feature complete? If it's not, I iterate. If it is, I then integrate it into my application framework. The application, we compose this application of these, these features. I obviously then write and run lots of tests. Not that many tests, actually. So at this level, you might be considering doing, doing DOM-based testing, actually hitting the DOM and having a full end-to-end -end suite of tests. Keep that small. You might manually test it, build, deploy, so on, and then go back to creating your next feature. So quite a simple workflow. So I want to talk about building these single features in isolation. The great thing about this is that it means that an individual or a team can focus on building that one piece of functionality. They know where all the assets are because all the assets um, related to that feature are to together on disk. So it's easy to find those things. And it also reduces the chances of any sort of conflict with, in terms of that, um, that feature, the, function, uh, the, the code relating to that feature. So we've called them blades, hence Blade Runner JS. So I'm to, again, if I use Gmail as a reference point, this is how I might break Gmail down. Unfortunately, I haven't written Gmail, but we are working towards having a complex application to demo. I'm going to use a to-do list. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, OK. So the best one is probably just to look at the Compose view. So we can take that as a single piece of functionality. We can, we can write our um, rich email. We can search the maybe a contact service of some sort to get our um, contact details if we type those in we can attach files and so on. But you can see how it might be quite nice to have that piece of functionality running together in isolation. 
And there's a bunch of other things you could break up. The, as I said, the, the email list, maybe the labels, maybe just this, this, this tab bar across the top, maybe the search functionality, or maybe the drop-down menu. How you compose these, these features is really up to you, and you can do it on a much larger scale, or you can do it on a smaller scale. It's really up to you. So if we look at Kaplan Trader, we have, we have a trade tile blade. Um, we've got uh, a news blade, top stories blade. We've got a chart blade. Uh, we've got a grid blade, we might have uh, like a layout blade and a drop down menu. So this is demo, this is where I bottled out and didn't do it myself. So hopefully this is big enough for everyone to see. <coughs> and stand over here to the day. So this is using the toolkit. <coughs> BRGS is the executable. I'm going to create an application called BRGS to do. I'm going to create a to do app and I'm going to split it into two bits. Create a blade set, ignore that. I want to get rid of that as part of our workflow. I think it just adds complexity. We create a blade. We need to say what app it is and the, the blade set and it's a to-do input one. So I want to jump over here and this has created our BRGS to-do folder. In here, I will, I will zoom in. Um, the folder structure isn't as nice as I'd like it either. Than it. So we, we, we've come from a Java background, hence probably this layout. But basically in here we've got source and this horrible nested namespace. <laughs> We're getting rid of that. We're getting rid of that. Um, <laughs> and here's our code. So basically we write Node.js style code and our tooling deals with, with changing that into a style that works in the browser. I've got all my requirements up here. We use some, we've got something called Presenter for our um, UI stuff. It's built on top of Knockout. Here this component extends the presentation model. And the main thing is really that we've got this message property. The message property is the thing that we will bind and show in the UI. It just says hello world. And we've also got a button clicked function. Um, obviously when a button is clicked from the UI that will be called and you can see we're exporting um, here. So if I go over here and look at the HTML, <coughs> those that are familiar with Knockout will see that this is just, we're just doing data bind. We're saying the message property will go into the text, the inner text of this div, and then when this button is clicked, this button clicked event will be called. So it's, it's really pretty simple. We've also got a CSS, and, oh sorry, tests. It's again, another deep nested uh, <coughs> structure. The scaffolding or the, the, the skeleton create, uh, contains a basic test that we can, can run. That just um, It's just a starting point for you. And we've also got our CSS in there. So we have the idea of themes. So you can apply different themes to, to the same application. It's nothing new, really. And that's within themes. And here we've just got a standard one. I haven't got anything in there at the minute. Come on, Phil. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is kick off the development server. So the dev server does two things. It actually provides you access to some of the command line interface functionality, and it is the, the dev server for you to be building your app in. So localhost 7070 by default, we get a dashboard. Um, as I said, we can create a new app in here if we wanted, which would create this structure on disk. But I've got my BRGS to do. We've got the to do blade set that I want to get rid of. We've got to do input blade, and I can run it in this workbench. Now the workbench lets you view and build that piece of functionality in isolation. So you can see I've got a hello world label and a log me button. We've also got a nice visualization over here because we're using um, a specific way of representing our data, our view data, we can show this little visualization. These are called workbench tools and I'm hoping we can build a whole bunch of those. So just to prove this is real, I changed that to FOSDEM. So I did do this last night in my hotel room, so it's for real. Um, and I change it to positive just to prove that that's there. So that's our, that's our blade <coughs> running in isolation. So we're saying, okay, that's feature complete. It's not particularly interesting piece of functionality. But let's look at the app. The app just has this default template, which is which says successfully loaded, loaded application. This is found in another concept that we've introduced that I would like to get rid of and, and make an advanced feature called aspects. So just think of it as an app. I'm going to get rid of this P. We don't really need that for that paragraph. The main thing is that I'm requiring in an app class and I'm creating a new instance of it. So we find that in source. And in there, what I want to do is I want to basically bring in this blade and say, right, display that as part of this app. So I think I sped this bit up because I'm pretty slow at typing. So I need to require this app. And at the minute, we've got this, this relatively long namespace, BR just to do, to do, to do input, and then the name of our model. So they're view models for those who are kind of fighting, uh, who really want to know kind of what they are. 
Um, so I've got that example presentation model that we created, the, the hello world thing. I create a new instance of that model. And then what we want to do is we want to bind that model to the, the HTML view that we've got, the template. So we use this um, presenter component to do that. So I'm changing the, the variable names to be more obvious. So create the presenter component. The first parameter is actually an ID of the view. Um, and the second is the, the model instance. So I'm going to put the, the model in there first and then jump back to copy the view because it's a bit too long at the minute. Again, that's something else I'm hoping we can improve in the future. So there we go. So that will deal with the, um, the binding. And now all we need to do is add it to the DOM. So you might want to pass in the IDs that you would want to append or do it in some other way. But here we're just doing um, append child input component dot get element. And then we jump, jump back to the browser and refresh. You just get our blade composed in the application. And it works. So it's nothing particularly amazing. But that's the starting point. You build up your, your application functionality in this way. So the next thing I'm going to do is, is create an, a second blade. Hopefully. Oh no, so right, the next thing I'm going to do actually is um, that obviously isn't particularly interesting, but you don't want to be seeing me pretending to type for the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to copy over a bunch of functionality and just show you what, what that looks like now instead. So here we're instead requiring in something called a field, and instead of this being a message which was a property, it's now a field because it's going to be an input field. So this is part of our presenter um, UI library. And then we've got a key pressed instead. So if it's the enter key, I'm just going to clear, I'm going to log the value and then clear it. So the view's updated, we've now got an input. We're data binding on this to do text property and the value of it. This is a knockout thing to say, update the value, do the binding, the two-way binding um, after the key's down. And this is the thing the same when the key press call this key press event. So that's the bit where we're checking whether the enter, the enter key is pressed. So if we reload that, we also get a bit of styling. Not particularly great styling, it's, it's stolen from to do MVC, but hasn't got some of the uh, surrounding elements. But you can see that we enter that thing there. We're seeing the two-way binding in our visual presentation. Sorry, it's not that big. And when we click it, we get the hello again. So we've got a slight, um, if we go back to our app, you can see we've actually got that new blade or that, that updated blade in the application. So we, we need a second blade. So here I'm just going to copy in a to-do items blade that I've got. That I, um, if you're in the UK, you'd say you've blue petered. I've done that earlier. So I'll copy that in. And if we go to the dashboard and I refresh, well, I refresh is dead. But if I refresh, you'll see we've now got a to-do items blade. I can run that in the workbench. Um, and I've got some predefined, uh, predefined items in there. Demo of Osdem, pray for demo gods. I've obviously cheated. So it's got some really, really basic functionality. So we've got that second blade now. We want to add that to the application. And we do it in exactly the same way as we did the first blade. And hopefully I've sped this up significantly. <coughs> so all we do is we'll include the reference to this new blade that we've created. And I've actually called this one a, um, a view model because that's kind of really what it is. Um, and then I'm going to create an instance of that. I'm going to um, create this new component. I'm basically going to copy and paste this and just change a few items. We can maybe shift this into a utility function and do some of this, the common functionality for us. <coughs> So I'm going to create my items component. I'm going to change um, that to items component. I'm going to, that's going to be to do items instead. So the reference to that, that view HTML. Um, and I'm going to pass in the correct model. And if I go back to the application, hopefully, yep. Um, and I refresh, we'll see that we've got the, the, the second blade. So we've got blade one, which is input, blade two, which is items. The problem we've got is that these two things aren't communicating. And like Jan, Jan said in the, the last talk, you don't really want them to directly know about each other because you might decide to change your implementation of this. So how do we get these two things communicating? I think that's the end of my map up there. So I want to talk a little bit about the application architecture. So we need to require these complex interactions. Um, we need to allow these components to be changed and swapped out. So we might have a different implementation of the to-do items or a different implementation of the, the input. So how do you swap those out, both in terms of um, at load time, but also potentially at runtime? It needs to be easily extended so that we can you know, add new functionality. Um, it needs to be easily tested. We're building a quality application. We have a lot of tests, and it's proven that we, we're delivering pr 
quality product, so we're going to stick with that. And it, again, we go back to it needs to easily be maintained. Blades help with this, and mainly they help because it's an isolated piece of functionality, but also we use MVVM. Now, I've stolen this from um, someone else's slide. The main thing here is we've got this separation of concerns between our view model, which represents how the view should be rendered. So this is this logical representation. And it means that all our testing is done against this view model, and we don't test this view other than at the application level. So we've got this nice separation of concerns. We've got this difference between UI logic and business logic. And we've got this consistent architecture that all our UI components use. So the next things are services. Now, services are basically a cross-cutting concern. So you've got a whole bunch of blades, and there might be common functionality that each of those things need to access. That's where we would, we would put that functionality into a service. So it might be a persistent service to store records or to, to store, to do items. Um, it might be RESTful services. It might be real-time services to get real-time data from a real-time backend. Or you might do kind of non-UI functionality like logging. So you might log and the implementation might actually log to the console or maybe a service. The main thing here is that these things are, these things are interfaces. You, you, you request them using a string, and you'll see this later, um, which basically says what you want. And then you get something back, you know it has a contract, you know it has a bunch of functions on it that you can call and how, that should, um, how it should respond to you, um, but you don't know the implementation. Um, Martin Fowler would call this um, a dynamic service locator if you're interested, and I'll share these slides afterwards. So, as I said, we use these for cross cutting <coughs> concerns. The functionality is encapsulated behind this interface. We're having loose coupled communication because we're just, we're just interacting with an interface and not an implementation. We require them through uh, this string, not some sort of reference to the object definition or any sort of namespace for it, just, just a <coughs> string. Um, and we can have these dependencies injected at different times. So, for instance, at the, at the workbench level, we can inject a bunch of test services. Um, we can even write our own little workbench tools that pretend to be these services and interact with this, this UI component. And then at application time, we can load in a whole bunch of different services specifically for, for real runtime. Is this back-end services? Or? So this is all front-end, but these services will potentially be interacting with back-end services. But they're a, they're a front-end idea, architectural component. Okay, so I'm going to demo the service. So our event hub is actually a service. Now, you prob when you're doing a to-do app, you would probably use some sort of persistent service, and then it might fire events when events have been um, when new tasks have been added. But just for simplicity's sake, um, I've I've done used the, the event hub service for this. So <coughs> to do this, all I want to do is I want to take this. Th the data out that I want to send around. So firstly, I want to get the value from this, this text, uh, to-do text, and I'm just going to stick it in an object literal with a, a value of a property of title. I should have spent this bit on. So this is just the object that I'm going to send over the event hub. And I'm still going to clear down that value. So the next thing I need to do is I need to say that I'm going to use this service registry. Now, service registry is a singleton that's part of our application uh, infrastructure, our front-end application infrastructure. So I get that service <coughs> registry. And then any service that we get is actually a singleton as well. It's created as part of the, the bootstrapping. Or you can do it via code and pass in a new instance of, of the service definition. But here we're just going to get an event hub from the service registry. Pass in this logical name, we call them aliases. And then when someone presses the enter key, I'm going to publish that information and say um, we're, we're going to use channel as a way of filtering that data. So if you look at pub sub solutions, quite often you'll see channel or topic or subject. Here we're using channel. I'm just going to say the to do list, and I'm going to say um, has had to do added and I'm going to send the data. <clears throat> so at the minute there's nothing listening to this but I just, I'm going right, I'm going to publish this for anyone that's interested. <coughs> and the way I know that this it's to do list and to do added is because when I sneakily added this new to do items blade in here I know that I'm actually publishing on 
to-do list and to-do added. Now, there was a talk there about the dependency on knowing the names of these channels, which is quite valid. Again, you might probably use a service which is just a to-do a to do service. That might be a better way of doing this, but this demonstrates it pretty well. Um, so that's these uh, the channel name and the to-do added again. And what happens when this is when this event is fired, this to-do added is called. I'm passing in this to maintain the context of being this instance of this, this object. And then I'm going to do some stuff which updates the view model. So this is the view model. It's going to update the view model. And this update list. Basically. 